Hey, welcome back to Connection Point Studies. We're glad to have you along. We've been in this series called Subtle Influence. Our hope is that you will allow the subtle influence of this incredible sermon called the Sermon on the Mount help change your life. In the Northwest, we have a very different culture. Jason, it's great to have you with us. Great to be here. We actually wrote these uh, lessons together. Yeah. And it was kind of fun to work on these together. And we've been talking about the subtle influence of the Northwest. And um, what's the um, what's the one question or the one belief that everyone in the Northwest believes? in? Yeah, it's, kind it's of actually a, it's a very popular phrase, too. Okay. Actually, it's, it's the phrase. Do you guys believe in the truth? Whatever goes around, comes around. Yeah. So we actually want you to answer that question. It's a coffee cup question. You get around. Everyone in your group shares. And before you come back, read Matthew 6, 1 through 18. We'll come back and talk about that question in just a moment. So, Jason, give me another word for what that question is. Yeah, karma is the other word, another word for it. And and karma is this idea that whatever you do now is going to come back to you. It's the boomerang effect. It's this whole thing. Now, isn't there some truth to that? You know, there some people might believe in truth, and it might seem right where some people do good things and good things happen to good people, or bad things on the bad people, like someone who murders someone will go to jail. So it does seem right, yeah. but Jesus has have quite... You, well, just a second. Have you ever done have, something good? I have. Back to yes, you? and it almost influenced me to keep doing good, to try and hope that good things kept coming back to me. So, I mean, there there is some truth to this, and you're going to have people in this group that just believe this intently, uh, but why do we not believe this? You know, it's funny because Jesus says a lot of interesting facts on the ideas of karma. That he has quite a different perspective of th- this idea of what, whatever we, the good works we do deserve good things. You know, Jesus is all about grace. Grace is the opposite of karma. Karma says whatever good you do comes around and comes back. Grace is all about us not getting what we deserve. And I don't know about you, but I am glad that I don't believe in karma because I don't believe everything that I do comes back to me because of the forgiveness of God in my life and the grace of God in my life. That's powerful stuff. That's really good stuff. And, you know, our hope is that through this whole series, we we help contradict some of the influence of the Northwest culture and let the, the culture of Jesus really change our life and our, our view of life. So... Um, We've, we've asked them to read some passage here, and actually the Matthew 6, 1 through 18 is where we're focusing. And we've got a first question. As they go back, they're going to read this passage. And uh, we want them to focus on the question. You've got a question for Right. Me. So our first question for you guys is, why does God want us to give privately, pray privately, and fast privately? So this, this is a very interesting passage. In fact, I think if Jesus were here today teaching this today, he would discover that we kind of do the opposite of this a little bit, don't you think? Yeah. Um, we pray more publicly than we do privately. We fast. We, we love, you know, if you're, if you're hungry, you tell everybody, I'm fasting today. You know, <laughs> maybe we don't fast very much. So that's <laughs> no, no, I just, um, yep, no fasting here. <laughs> yeah. Or um, what we do publicly in acts of charity and all that, and we, you know, giving publicly, those are all very interesting things. Um, what do you think the temptation is here, Jason? You know, I think the temptation is to be to be public about it. I mean, there's a certain aspect when I say hey, I'm I'm fasting to you. I'm like, I'm kind of boasting about my righteousness. I think it's pride. Yes, that's exactly what you're saying there. Pride. When you have pride in your life. And all of a sudden, pride comes up. You you lose the power of prayer, of fasting, of giving. And this is really powerful teaching. Jesus is teaching us that you do the right thing when no one else is looking. And I, I like this about life. I, I like this about what Jesus is teaching. It's about who you are when no one's looking. Yeah, God's matters. God's a genuine God. And when we give privately, it's the genuine giving yeah. that we, and that it, we do. Yeah, I mean, there's times that they find out. When someone finds out you give, it's not like, oh, don't tell anybody I gave anything. It's not like that. It's it's more, it's more. you need to do it with the right motive in your heart. And that's really what Jesus is getting in the, at, at the heart of. 
Um, very interesting. So now as we dig to the next question, uh, let's give them the next question. Right. So the next question is list the instructions that Jesus gives about prayer. And I guess the question would be, is the Lord's prayer the only prayer we should pray? Okay, Jason, it's kind of fun. Uh, look at verse 5. It says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't pray publicly. Um, when you pray, go away, shut the door, pray in private. Then your Father who sees you will reward you. And when you pray, don't babble on, not, not like repetition all the time. And, uh, and then pray like this, which is now we get to this Lord's Prayer. Now, as you, as you look at all of these others, and we've kind of already talked about it, we kind of go against a lot of those ideas about prayer. But when we get to this Lord's Prayer, where would you say Jesus said to pray this Lord's Prayer? You know, I think he, he has it praying, or he has us pray that prayer privately. Whether, I mean, the repetitions or, or the time timing you do it is not necessarily the, the big deal. It doesn't matter if you do it right before bed or in the morning or at, in the afternoon, but kind of as you go about your day to continuously be thinking of this Lord's Prayer and continually be reminded of the Lord's Prayer in your thoughts and in your um, in your mind. It could be before you go to bed as well. Like it doesn't have to be. Okay, now Jason, in any let's, specific let's be honest place. here. I don't. Do you ever pray the Lord's Prayer? I not word for word, no. Unless no. I'm in Catholic Mass. I, I yeah. I I don't, as a general rule, pray pray the Lord's Prayer very often. Um, and when I do pray it, it's usually in public because that's the time. But when I look at the Lord's Prayer, it sets up a really good pattern for us in how we pray. And so in a sense, I pray the Lord's Prayer probably more than I think because it becomes a pattern for my life. It talks about, you know, hey, I want your will, Lord. Help me to have your will. Forgive me for uh, the sins of my life. Forgive those people. It's, it's a great pattern. So I encourage you. I don't think Jesus necessarily wanted us to pray word for word these words in a closet quietly. I think it's all about just being honest and using this as a pattern. Now, you talked earlier about um, your method of praying. Um, how do you pray? You know, it, it is a lot like the the structure of the Lord's Prayer, where it starts out, it says, Our Father in heaven, you know, may your name be kept holy. So I start off with this this worship, the giving God credit for, uh, what yeah, what he's doing. And then it goes on to, you know, God's will. So then I say, God, I, I want your will to be done. I want to live my life the way you want me to. And I want to do these things. It's not always the guide me, but it's always like maybe sometimes I'm struggling to live the will that God has for me. So it's always me in this conversation with God trying to figure out where I'm going or what to do in different situations. Right. Um, and then later it talks about the, the provisions that we have. So, you know, we ask God, God provide for me, continue to give me yeah. strength. And, you know, it's, it provides really good structure to, to how we, what we should pray for and how we should pray. Now, I think, um, I think, I don't know about you, but I have learned to pray in public, privately, which is kind of interesting because Jesus talks about getting alone. But sometimes when I'm in a group of people, I can be praying and they don't know that I'm praying because I'm in my mind praying. And I, I think this is an attitude that allows you to be private about your praying, but be very effective in your prayers. And it's, it's a pretty powerful way to pray. Well, hopefully you have a chance to share about the way you pray, how you encourage each other in prayer. And we even encourage our groups to pray publicly. It's not that that is wrong. It's just that you don't, you shouldn't do that with the wrong motive or the wrong ideas. I think that's the key. So uh, let's, let's go to this next section of scripture and, and talk about it. Right. So our next question for you guys is why won't God forgive you if you don't forgive someone else? And then is that the unforgivable sin? Okay, some of you have had this whole debate about the unforgivable sin, and I brought up this question that you go, where did that come from? When I look at it, I, I was looking at that question, and I, I'm thinking, I, it is unforgivable for you to, un, to not forgive. It's not that God won't forgive that sin. It's that our act of unforgiveness doesn't allow God to forgive that sin. So in some sense, it is unforgivable. That sin is unforgivable. Now, the unforgivable sin they talk about is the one sin that you do and, oh, boop, you're done, you know, you're out of here. <laughs> that's not, that's really not what we're talking about here. But it is unforgivable if you're unwilling to let go of the things that have been done wrong to you in your life. And, and that's why Jesus is really, really clear. It, and he talks about 
God forgiving others only as much as you forgive them. And uh, Jason, we've had conversations about forgiveness. It's it's hard to continually forgive. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it's also a different a, a different aspect to this too. Is that um, in the perspective of God, God's forgiven us as, us as well, but He's also forgiven the people that we might be. Yeah. not forgiving and so when we say i'm not going to forgive this one person that's almost us indirectly saying god you're wrong yeah. for forgiving this person well and what do we want we want justice yeah we talked about it we want you know smote him down i remember the psalms they talk about all the time david crying out god you get that enemy of mine get him you know and really i think jesus is teaching a very different way of approaching things so just keep that in mind interesting discussion um Let's go on in verses 16 through 18. Very different aspect. Uh, let's ask him the question. Yeah, next question is, does God expect us to fast? Okay, fasting, if you didn't know what it was, is doing without a meal to make time to pray for something that's very important to you. And uh, they had a practice of fasting then, um, where you would sometimes fast for a day, sometimes fast for a week. And in Jesus' time, people fasted all the time. A number of the Pharisees fasted. When they fasted, they would go out and tell everybody how hungry they were and how they were fasting. And they were supposedly holier than everyone else because they were doing without a meal. Um, it, it's interesting. Do you think Jesus expects you to fast? You know, in this scripture, it actually doesn't say that we have to fast. Okay. Uh, but I think the benefits of fasting is is good to practice. I think fasting is a is a very unique and special part of being being a Christian and being following God. Yeah, when well, verse sixteen he says, "And when, when you, you fast, fast," it kind of implies that you should be fasting somewhere along the mm -hmm. line. You fast. When's the last time you fasted? You know, the last time I fasted was my freshman year in college, and so I'm a junior now. So that was two years ago, That's and I fasted for twenty eight hours. Okay, and was that hard? Miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I did a seven-day fast one time. Wow. Seven uh, days of just water. Yeah, now I've lost all my reward because I told you about it. But <laughs> oh, well, too bad for that. But here's the deal. It was it was really meaningful to me. I did it with a group of guys, and we had a very specific purpose we were doing this for. And you know, I challenge you. There's different times in your life when I think fasting is really important. Um, when you come to a really difficult decision that you're trusting God to give you an answer for, and you need to listen more carefully. I think fasting is really important. Sometimes when you know one of your friends is in trouble and you just simply want to listen to God and pray for that person and so you set aside the time, sometimes there's a really benefit as a group to fast and you together are collectively asking for God's opinion. So those are all good ideas. Maybe you find yourself in that situation. It'd be a good chance for you to learn how to fast and to develop fasting in your life. So let's go to the application question. We've kind of talked about the scripture, a lot in the scripture. Let's give them something to think about and get everyone in the group yeah. to share about. So what can you fast this week or what can you abstain from this next week? Yeah, because we're thinking fasting could be beyond food, right? Right. If you could fast from alcohol. You could fast from uh, sweets. Yeah, I would say chocolate. chocolate. I was thinking or, chocolate right there. Yeah, something. Or what, TV. What, yeah, yeah, TV. That's a good thought. So here's, a, here's an idea for you this week. What is it that you'd be willing to fast from and make an application in your life and just spend a little bit more time praying and connecting with God? Hopefully you'll get a chance to share and do that. And we will see you next week at Connection Point Studies.